The Trimampara Raja, the king of Cochin, was a man who had many troubles. His throne was never secure, and it wasn't just the political factions that surrounded him, but members of his own family who were based in the nearby town of Edipali that were all maneuvering to seize his crown. To make matters even worse, he was a vassal to the Samudri Raja of Calicut, whose rule extended over many of the cities of the Malabar coast, including Cochin. Thus, the ruler of Cochin needed something, anything, to stay on top. Opportunity would soon present itself. When the Portuguese had arrived in the Indian Ocean, it wasn't long before war had broken out with Calicut. The Europeans had dealt the Samudri Raja one defeat after another. They had bombarded the city several times, and they had even destroyed the Calicut fleet. As a result, many of the city-states of the Malabar coast rose up in defiance. Cochin was among them. The Trimampara Raja, again the king of Cochin, had welcomed in the Portuguese with open arms. He allowed them to continue their trade in spice, thus made them extremely wealthy, and allowed them to build a fortress in his city. But now matters had taken a dramatic change for the worse. The king of Cochin now looked out at his city. It was still rebuilding. It was not that long ago that it had been burned to the ground. In February of 1503, Vasco da Gama, the Admiral of India, had left the Indian Ocean with his armada. He had left behind a flotilla of ships to guard Cochin, but those captains had abandoned their post in search of plunder on the Red Sea and were subsequently destroyed. By April of that year, the Samudri Raja, also known as the Zamoran, had sensed their weakness. He raised a massive army of 50,000 warriors in Calicut and had marched on Cochin. The Trimampara Raja had at best 5,500 warriors, whom he placed under the command of his heir, Prince Narayan. The warrior prince had marched out, and at the town of Edapali, he put up a stout defense at the ford of a river. Though outnumbered nearly 10 to 1, Narayan was able to hold off two direct assaults. Roger Crowley, in the book Conquerors, brings justice to this valiant stand. Quote, after having some initial military success, the Samudri Raja bribed the prince's men into disaffection, and Narayan was killed. The territory of Cochin was eventually overrun, but according to the laws of the Hindu military caste, the 200 surviving members of the prince's army swore themselves to ritual death. They shaved off all their hair and advanced towards Calicut, killing everyone they met until they had been hacked down to the last man. This sacrifice bought the king and the Portuguese time. They retreated from Cochin to the offshore island of Vaipin. The Samudri Raja of Calicut thus entered Cochin and burned the city to embers. But he wasn't able to reach the island of Vaipin as the monsoon weather had set in. The Samudri fell back to Calicut as rain and rough seas started to batter the Malabar coast. However, he swore to return in August and destroy all those who resisted him." End quote. In late August of 1503, the Zamorin returned, but as he prepared to lay siege to the island of Ipin, his scouts reported the arrival of an incoming force. Two well-armed ships had just entered the harbor of Cochin. They were under the command of Francisco de Albuquerque, a military man with a very short temper. A few days later, another four ships would also arrive. This new flotilla just happened to be under the command of Francisco's cousin. His name was Afonso de Albuquerque. This man possessed a natural flair for combat and his confidence was justified. He was dedicated to warfare. In his nearly five decades of life, he had fought the Arabs in North Africa, the Ottomans in Italy, and the Castilians in Portugal. Afonso was destined to also make a name for himself in the Indian Ocean. In time, he would become one of the most impressive military commanders in history. These six ships were a contingent of the 5th Portuguese Armada. Their presence was immediately felt. The Zamorin, the Samudri Raja, dismantled his siege and withdrew his army. He decided to hold off hostilities till early the next year where he predicted correctly that the Portuguese Armada would once again have to leave. Make no mistake, the Samudri was definitely going to be back, and this time with greater numbers. <laughs>
Francisco de Albuquerque immediately took the credit for, quote, routing the army of Calicut. However, all the Portuguese commanders knew that Cochin was by no means out of danger. They had to move fast. A punitive raid was launched in the Vembanad Lagoon. Villages that had helped the Zamorin were attacked and destroyed. The city of Etapali, where the rival family members of the king of Cochin lived, was brutally razed to the ground, and many of those rivals were put to death. The Portuguese, after all, were not going to take any chances with someone else coming to power in Cochin. In record time, Fort Santiago, later named Fort Manuel, was built at the mouth of the harbor. Inside of the fort, the Portuguese built their first church in India named Sao Bartholomew. Their message was clear. The Europeans were here to stay. Afonso de Albuquerque, meanwhile, led negotiations with the Queen Regent to the city of Colom, where spices were purchased and another Portuguese factory was to be built. However, the monsoon winds were shifting and the time to leave was quickly approaching. In late January of 1504, the 5th Portuguese Armada departed for home. Its journey would be ill-fated. Francisco de Albuquerque hit rough weather in the Mozambique Channel and was never heard from again. Of the 10 ships that had been part of the Armada, only five made it back to Portugal. And those that did, including the one carrying Afonso de Albuquerque, only barely made it. However, before Afonso left, he made a decision that would forever shape the Portuguese fortune in India. Afonso had placed one of his most skilled and articulate captains in charge of the defense of Cochin. That man's name was Duarte Pacheco Pereira. Duarte Pacheco Pereira was born in Lisbon in the year 1460. He was the embodiment of a Renaissance man. He was intelligent, well-educated, inquisitive, and perfectly at home on the battlefield. The great poet Luiz de Camões would describe him as the Portuguese Achilles in the epic poem Luzeadas, where he was described as having a pen in one hand and a sword in the other. Duarte seemed to have been involved everywhere in the early Portuguese empire. In 1475, he graduated with a formal education and would go on to become the king of Portugal's personal squire, where he would become extremely well acquainted with the intrigue of the court. Later, he would be involved in various expeditions along the coast of West Africa. When he got shipwrecked in one of his journeys, he was picked up and saved by Bartholomew Diaz on his famous return from the Cape of Good Hope. In 1494, Duarte was also involved in the critical Treaty of Tordesilla, which divided the world between the Spanish and the Portuguese. In 1488, it was even hinted that he might have been the first European to have discovered the coast of South America, two years prior to the celebrated time of Cabral in 1500. He was an avid learner who wrote books on exploration, studied the interaction of primates, calculated the arc meridian to its most accurate degree and was one of the first Europeans to scientifically understand the relationship between the moon and the tides. Indeed, the mathematical models he formulated were able to predict the rhythm of the tides better than anyone had ever done before. This last bit of knowledge, by the way, would one day, strangely enough, save his life. In early 1504, the Samudri of Calicut was busy at the work of logistics. He had called in reinforcements from across his domain to gather an army of 60,000 men. By some estimates, it was as high as 87,000. He had expanded his fleet to 260 ships, albeit many were relatively minor and somewhat fragile vessels, but they did have guns. From the Ottomans, the Samudri purchased over 300 smaller cannons, though they were a bit obsolete. The Venetians, meanwhile, had secretly dispatched two agents that had technical knowledge which allowed the King of Calicut to forge five larger cannons. These Venetian guns, by the way, were powerful enough to destroy Portuguese ships. The Portuguese, on the other hand, had 150 men, along with three ships, two caravels and one carac. The Trimampara Raja rallied his army and sent out a plea for mercenaries. He was hoping for 30,000 recruits, only 8,000 showed up, but many deserted, leaving about 5,000 Nayar warriors in the end. Duarte Pereira had been well informed of what his opponent was doing. 
During the course of the entire battle, the Portuguese commander's intelligence service was exceptional. It revealed his enemy's movements, composition, supply chains, everything down to the five Venetian cannons that the Samudri had made. Pereira first made it a point to bolster morale. He wanted everyone to know that the Portuguese were here to defend the city to the last. He stockpiled food, surveyed the land for the most defensible locations, and had his men build wooden stockades. He kept the population at Cochin from abandoning the city. Instead, he got them to work creating extra cannonballs from stone. He also had the people carve 12-foot-long spears, thousands of them. Duarte then created large wooden shields for his ships, each were covered with mats of cotton. Thus, his ships would be protected from small cannon fire. He then began to deploy his men. 39 men in the Karak were positioned at Fort Manuel. Some of the men were placed in the city of Cochin, and the rest were deployed along the lagoon at various strategic crossing points. In these narrow fords and crossing points, the wooden spears were drilled into the lake bed at various depths. Some were embedded very deep to slow a person's movement across the shallow water, whereas other spears were positioned at a level that they would skewer a man alive if he fell on them. The 5,000 Nayar warriors at Cochin were also positioned alongside the Portuguese men. Now all that was left was to await the arrival of the Samudri and his army. On March 31, 1504, the Zamorin of Calicut arrived. He moved in on the fort of Cumbalam with the intent to cross the lagoon and advance on the city. Here, Pereira decided to make his stand, but this sudden appearance of over 60,000 warriors at Calicut shattered his men's morale. Many fled, leaving only 90 Portuguese and a few hundred Nayar. Duarte immediately deployed all three of his ships to the fort. The Samudri Raja countered this by bringing up his big Venetian cannons. Herrera quickly responded to this new threat. He had his men keep up a sporadic fire on the cannons, which in turn dispersed their crews. The three ships then quickly turned around and began to fire on anyone who attempted to cross the ford of Kambalan. The Raja in turn ordered a portion of his Calicut fleet to attack. Over 150 ships moved in. But it was low tide, so only a handful could make it through the shallow waters of the lagoon at a time. The Portuguese sailors brought their guns to bear and began to pick them off in piecemeal. When the Indians attempted to return fire with their smaller cannons, the cannonballs simply bounced off the padded wooden shields. That day, wave after wave after wave of naval attack was sent in. All of them failed as the Calicut death toll soared. The carnage became so bad that even the wreckage of the Indian ships became an obstacle. Without this much-needed naval support, the Samudri would not dare have his men cross the Cumbalam Ford. By midday, he called off the attack. It was a humiliating beginning for the King of Calicut. At least 30 ships destroyed and 1,500 casualties. But the Raja was by no means done. On April 7th, a week later, the Samudri Raja attacked again. His plan this time was a two-pronged assault. The first portion was a diversionary naval attack on the city. If the Portuguese raced to secure Cochin, they would leave the Pass of Cumbalam open, at which time the Raja of Calicut could cross with his men and attack. Of course, it wasn't long before Duarte Pereira knew of this strategy and planned accordingly. The Portuguese commander positioned his stronger Karak at the mouth of the harbor and left his two faster caravels at the Cumbalam Ford. The Karak was soon fighting off the enemy. Pereira had his faster caravels race to assist the Karak. When the Samudri's men saw the incoming ships, they realized that they were going to be caught in a crossfire. They brought down their sails and quickly retreated. Duarte knew that the tide was going out. At low tide, the Ford of Cumbalam could be crossed. He had all three of his ships get back to it as fast as they could. The Portuguese flotilla arrived just in the nick of time and began to unleash their guns on anything that moved. The Raja's fleet was battered and anyone attempting to cross the ford soon found themselves in a watery grave. This time, the Samudri would lose 19 ships and 300 men. Duarte wasted no time. The next day, on April 8th, he took the offensive and had his ships launch a series of attacks along the entire lagoon. 
At key locations, the Portuguese would make landfall to destroy the Raja's supplies and prove that his soldiers were vulnerable even in their camps. Now, while these attacks didn't do much damage, it did psychologically stun the warriors of Calicut and greatly angered the Samudri Raja, who now fiercely wanted those Portuguese ships destroyed. On April 9th, 1504, the Zamorin redeployed his Venetian guns near the city of Cochin, where the Portuguese fleet had taken anchor. The battery of guns that were placed were heavily defended with wooden ramparts, making them impervious to bombardment. The Samudri made it a point to keep his vulnerable fleet back, hoping that his cannons could finish the job. Then, with a single command from the Raja, the cannons opened up and began firing on Pereira's ships. Now, keep in mind that these guns were powerful enough to demolish the ships, and they had the range to hit them, but their crews were inexperienced and lacked the precision to hit their targets. One volley after another fell short. Duarte commanded his men to do nothing. For several hours, the Venetian guns fired without hitting anything and without taking any return fire. This confused the Samudri and his men, who came to the decision that the Portuguese must be out of ammunition. The Venetian guns were moved out of their protective positions to get a better shot, and the Calicut fleet decided to sail in to take advantage of what seemed like an obviously golden opportunity. This was precisely what Duarte Pereira was waiting for. At point-blank range, the Portuguese fleet came to life. One volley after another was unleashed, smashing the Raja's ships to pieces. And when the wind turned to their favor, Duarte's men sailed up to the now-exposed Venetian guns and utterly destroyed them. A demoralized Samudri Raja was forced to retreat his forces. Once again, his casualty list was extensive. It was in late April that Duarte's spies reported that the Zamorin had taken down his camp at the Cumbalam Ford and had started to march north. At first, it seemed that the forces at Calicut were done and were retreating back to their city. But soon, it became apparent that they were only maneuvering into a new position at the island of Araul. The Samudri Raja had regained his nerve for battle and was now ready to unleash everything he had. 